Welcome to Commvault Connections. My name is Dave Vellante, and we're going to dig into the changing security landscape and look specifically at ransomware and what steps organizations can take to better protect their data, their applications, and their people. So, you know, cyber threats continue to escalate. In the past 19 months, we've seen a major shift in CISO strategies, tactics, and actions as a direct result of the trend toward remote work, greater use of the cloud, and the increased sophistication of cyber criminals. In particular, we've seen a much more capable, well-funded and motivated adversary than we've ever seen before. Stealthy techniques like living off the land, island hopping through the digital supply chain, self-forming malware, and escalations in ransomware attacks necessitate vigilant responses. And we're super pleased today to be joined by Dave Martin, who's a ch global chief security officer at ADP. Dave, welcome, good to see you. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Okay, let's get right into it. This is a great topic. I mean, ADP, we're talking about people's money. I mean, it doesn't get more personal and sensitive than that. Maybe healthcare, but money's right there on the priority list. But maybe you could start by telling us a bit about your role at the company, how you fit into the organization with your colleagues, like the, you know, the CIO, the CDO, maybe describe that a bit if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're somewhat unusual in uh, both, both structure and we, one of the ways is we're a, uh, I have a very converged organization. So my responsibility extends from both the physical protection of kind of buildings, our associates, um, travel safety through fraud that we see in uh, attempted in our products, all the way through to a more traditional uh, chief security officer um, in the cyberspace. And uh, the other thing that's a little bit unusual is rather than reporting into a technology organization, I actually report into our chief administrative officer. So my peers in that organization are legal compliance. Uh, so we, it, it's a great position to be in the organization. And I've had various different reports uh, during my career. And there's always a lot of debate in, uh, in, uh, with my peers about where's the best place to report. And I, I think I always come back to, it's not really where you report, it's about those relationships that you mentioned. So how do you actually uh, collaborate and work with the chief data officer, the, the CIO, kind of the head of product, the product organization, and how do you use that to create this kind of very dynamic agile force to defend against uh, the threats we face today? Yeah, now, so let's just want to clarify for the audience. So when you talk about that converged structure, Oftentimes, if I, if I understand what your point is, that the network team might be responsible for some of the physical security or the network security. That's all under sort of one roof in your organization. Is that correct? So a lot of the controls and operations, something like firewalls is out in the CIO organization, um, but the, the core responsibility and accountability, whether it's protecting the buildings, the data centers, the, uh, the data in our applications, the uh, kind of the back office of all the services that we use to, to deliver value to our clients and kind of the same things that everyone has, the, uh, the ERP environments, and email, all of that, the protecting those environments rolls up to my team from uh, an accountability and government perspective. Got it. So, I mean, as I was saying up front, I mean, the, the acceleration, we all talk about that acceleration, that compression, the force march to digital and that, that solar winds hack, it was like a Stuxnet moment to me because it signaled almost this new level of escalation by cyber criminals. And that had to send a shockwave through your community. I wonder if you could talk about it at a high level. How did that impact the way that CISOs think about cyber attacks or, or did it? Well, I think we're, we're very used to watching the outside world kind of adversaries don't stand still, our businesses don't stand still. So we're constantly having to evolve. So it's just, another call to action. How do we think about what we just saw? And then how do we kind of realign the controls that we have? And then how do we think about our program going forward that we need to adjust? Yeah, so we've seen, uh, when we talk, talk to other CISOs, your colleagues, we, we, they tell us we've made a big sort of budget, you know, allocation toward endpoint security, cloud, identity access management, uh, and, and obviously focus on a flatter network and of course, ransomware, how, how have you shifted priorities as a result of sort of the last, you know, the pandemic 19 months? 
yeah, definitely seeing that shift in kind of the necessity of working from home and kind of thinking about what tools that we need to get to our associates um, to really make them successful and then also keep our uh, the integrity of our data and the availability of our services in that new model. And so we've made that shift in technology and controls reinforced a lot of things that we already had. One thing, thinking about the uh, that supply chain change that we saw out of SolarWinds is thinking about ransomware defense prior to that was very much around uh, aligning the defenses within and the, the perimeter of your network uh, within the cloud environments. And now we're really thinking about kind of where do I, outside that environment, where do I exchange files from? What connectivity do I have with partners and suppliers? What services do they provide um, to support us as an enterprise? And what's going to happen if they're not there at a minimum, but then what happens if they have a, a some kind of attack that can actually drive some of this malware and spread into the network or via some of those file transfers? Make sure we've really sure, shored up the controls in that area, but the the response is a key part of that. How am I going to react when I hear from even a client? We're a, a very customer service focused company. We want to do whatever we can to help. And the instinct of one of our frontline associates, maybe, hey, send send me that Excel file. Uh, I'll take care of it. So now, yeah, we still want to help that client through, but we want to think through a little bit more before we start sharing a uh, an office file back and forth between two environments, one of which we know to be compromised. Right, that's interesting what you're saying about the, the change and you know, just focus on the perimeter to the the, the threats you know within, uh, without, et cetera, because you don't even need a high school degree or you know gray, diploma to be a ransomware attacker these days. You could go on the dark dark web, and if you're a bad bad person, you can hire ransomware as a service. If you have access to a server or credentials, you know, you can do bad things. And hopefully, you'll end up in handcuffs. But but that's a legitimate threat today, which is you know relatively new in the way in which people are escalating, whether it's you know crypto ransoms, etc really do necessitate new thinking around uh, uh, ransomware. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the layered approach that you might take, the air gapping, uh, be interested to, to understand where Commvault fits in to the, to, the, to the portfolio, if you will. Sure, I, and really uh, it's thinking about this in depth. You're not going to be able to, uh, to protect or recover everything. So really understand, first of all, kind of what is most important to be able to maintain service what data do you, do you need to protect and have available? Armed with that, now you can go through uh, the, the rest of the NIST plan, uh, cybersecurity framework and make think you're doing the best for prevention, uh, for, for detection and response in that area. And then kind of really uh, interesting when we get to the recovery phase, both from a Commvault perspective and in many attacks where we, we really want to focus on prevention, but ultimately we're likely to see a scenario, even in some small part of our environment where some kind of attack is effective. And now we're, we're back at that recovery step. And we don't want that to be the first time we're testing those backups. We don't want to be the first time that we figure out that those backups have been on the network the whole time and they can't be used for recovery. So partnering with everyone in the environment, we talk about it takes a village to defend against this kind of threat getting everyone engaged, the experts in each of these fields, to make sure that we're thinking, they understand this threat and how real it is and what their role is going to be in setting up that protection and defense. And then come that dark day that we all hope will never happen. But what's that, when do you need them? What do you need them to be doing so that you can bring, get back to a restoration and effective operation point as soon as possible? Yeah, I hope for the best, plan for the worst. So it's a, a big part of that is education. Um, and of course the backup corpus is an obvious target because everything's in there. Uh, but, but before we get into sort of the best practice around that, I, I wanted to ask you about your response because one of the things that we've seen is, is that responses increasingly have to be stealthy uh, so that you don't necessarily alert the, the attackers that you know that they're inside. Is, is that sort of a, a new trend and how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, it's always it's always a balance depending on the type of data and the, the type of attack as to kind of 
how uh, kind of violent and swift and obvious you have to be to be able to protect the environment, protect the integrity of your data, and then also balance against kind of tipping off the attacker, which can potentially make things worse. So always a conversation depending on the different threat type um, that you're going to have to go through. And it really helps to have some of those conversations up front to have tabletops, not just at a technical level, and make sure you're walking through the steps of response to make it as uh, as seamless and quick and effective as possible, but also having that conversation with leadership team and, and even the board around the kind of decisions they're going to have to make and make sure that you, wherever possible, use scenarios to, uh, to figure out what are some of those actions that are likely to be taken and uh, also empower some teams. It's really important to be able to act autonomously and quickly. You, uh, you don't want to be at 2 a.m. kind of looking for, uh, for the CEO or, or kind of the executive team to get them out of bed to make a decision. Some of these decisions need to be made very quickly and, uh, and very effectively. And you can only do that with empowered upfront and sometimes even automated uh, processes to do them. D Dave, describe what you mean by tabletops. I, mean, I presume you're talking a top-down view versus sort of being in the weeds, but, but, but add some color to that, please. Yeah, definitely. It, it literally is kind of getting everyone around the table. And uh, at ADP, at least once per year, we actually get the full executive team together and challenge them with a scenario, making sure that they're, they're working through the problem. They know what each of their roles are at the table. And uh, I'm lucky to have a, a fantastic leadership team. We're actually very practiced. We've done this often enough now that they really pull apart really hard problems and think about what their decision is going to need to be made. So come that dark day, if it ever does, they're not kind of challenged by their never thought. They don't, un they understand the technical background of why they're being asked to make a decision and the limitations of what their responses may be. So a lot of people in process goes into this, always the case. But let's talk a little bit about the tech. I mentioned the backup corpus is an obvious target before. W what are some of the best tech practices in terms of protecting, whether it's that backup corpus, other data, uh, air gaps? Maybe you could give us some guidance on that front. Sure, I, I, we're not going to be able to protect everything. So focus on those favorite children is the uh, the best advice up front. To think about the uh, the critical components that enable you to bring things up. It's easy to go focus on that critical data and that most important app that everyone in the company understands, but all of that cannot even start if you don't have the foundation. The network's not up and running. The authentication services are not up and running. So it's good to go focus uh, some elements and, and practice that technical tabletop setting of what, how do you go through recovering an active directory forest back to a known trusted state? Because that's one of the foundations you're going to need to build anything else back up. On the backup side is make sure that you don't use the same credentials that we, your backup administrators use every day. Make sure there's only the smallest number of people have access to be able to control the backups. If at all possible, and uh, in Convol and, and many backup solutions now, make sure they're using a second factor of authentication to be able to get into those systems. And also make sure that some of the backups that you have are kind of offline, air gapped, can be touched. Uh, and then also think about the duration. You talked about the attackers being very smart and determined. They know how uh, enterprises prepare and respond. So think about the uh, how long you're retaining and where you're retaining some of the backups, not just incrementals to be able to fully restore a system, basically from bare metal or from bare cloud. And and you're using Commvault software to manage some of this 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 capability. Is that right? I'm sure you have a bevy of tooling. Yeah, we have a wide range of tooling, but yeah, we're certainly a, a Commvault one. And somebody said, a consultant said to me the other day, you know, Dave, I'm I'm thinking about advising my clients that their air gap process should be air gapped. In other words, they should have a sort of a separate, you know, remote removed from the mainstream process just for extra protection. And I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. But at the same time, then do they have the knowledge to get back to, you know, a low RPO state? What do you think about, about that approach? So the challenges of any kind of re recovery and control design is a, like making sure that you're make, not making things overly complex and introducing other issues and also other exposures. If you're moving out of your normal control environment that you have a 24 by seven, 365 set of monitoring, 
the more creative you get, you perhaps are in danger of kind of having control erosion and visibility being uh, lagged to that uh, other state. Um, but it is really important to think about, even at the communication level, um, is in this kind of attack, you may not be able to rely on email, kind of teams, all of the common services you have. So how are you actually going to communicate with this village it's going to take to recover to be able to uh, work through the process? So that's definitely an area that I would advocate for having offline capabilities to be able to have people react, gather, respond, plan, and control the recovery, even though the uh, the main enterprise may not be currently functioning. I wonder if I could pick your brain on another topic, which is you know zero trust prior to the pandemic. A lot of times people would roll their eyes like it's a buzzword, but it's kind of become a, a mandate. People are now talking about you know eliminating credentials. They're talking about converging identity access management and governance and privilege access uh, access management. I mean, what are those some of the sea changes you see around so-called zero trust? Yeah, I, I think kind of zero trust has become that kind of call to action buzzword, but these concepts that are embodied in a zero trust journey are ones that have been around for forever, kind of least privilege. And it's how we think about, uh, you can't go buy a product that oh, I, I'm just implementing zero trust. How do you think strategically about where you take your starting point and then go on this journey to kind of increase the, uh, the the various tools that start to limit, improve the segmentation, not only from a network standpoint, from a service standpoint, from an identity standpoint, and make sure you're embracing concepts like persona so that you start to break up the, uh, you may not get to zero trust anytime soon, but you're able to get less and less trust in that model. And to think about it in many different worlds, think about your product access, if you're a uh, service provider company like we are, as well as kind of the uh, internal employee uh, context. So there's many um, elements, it's a complex journey. It's not something you're going to buy off the shelf and go implement, but it, it's one that you're going to have to, again, uh, partner with those other stakeholders that you have, because there's user experience and client experience components of this journey, some of which are actually quite positive, uh, you mentioned passwordless uh, as one of those components of the journey. Certainly something that actually has a better user experience and also can offer a uh, better security and freedom from the traditional passwords that we've come to like to hate. Dave, I know you're tight on time. I got two more questions for you. One is, what is the CISO's number one challenge? Wow, it's uh, getting enough sleep. No, um, <laughs> it really is just staying current with that business environment, that threat environment and the available tool sets and making sure that we're constantly working with those partners that we keep describing to chart that course to the future. So that we're, this is a race that doesn't have a finish line. The marathon gets a little bit longer every year and kind of bringing my peers on and making them understand that kind of it's easy to get fatigued and say, ah, I thought we, thought we were done when we finished this uh, initiative. It's just keeping everyone's uh, energy up and focus on a, a very long management. 1A in that question, if I may, is, is many organizations lack the talent to be able to do that. You may not, you may, you may have a, a firmer, but the industry as a whole really lacks the, the, the skills and the talent and really that's why they're looking to automation. How, acute do you see that talent shortage? It, it's definitely there. And I think it's important to realize that kind of the, the uh, back to that village concept, everybody has a play here. So what as a smaller uh, available talent pool in the, uh, the security industry is, we've really got to be that call to action. We've got to explain why this is important. We've got to be the consultants that kind of lead through what changes are we going to need to make to be successful? Like it's tempting to say, oh, oh, they'll never do that. Like we've got to do it ourselves. We, we will never be successful in just being the security team that tries to do everything. It's bringing everyone along for the journey. And part of that is just going to be this constant socialization and education of what they need to do, why it's so important. Uh, and then you really will build a great partnership. My last question, I was kind of been keeping a list of, of, of Dave's best practice. I so saw obviously the layered approach you want to get to that NIST framework. There's a lot of education involved. You got to partner with your colleagues. 
the tabletops, executive visibility, so everybody knows what their role is, kind of the do your job. You've got to build zero trust. You can't just buy zero trust off the shelf. And, and, and uh, so that's my kind of quick list. Am I, am I missing anything? No, I, I think that's pretty good. And then just in that partnership, you know, it, this is a tiring kind of hard thing to do and kind of just bring everyone along. They, they, they can help you do so much, especially if you explain to them how it's going to make their product better, how it's going to make their client experience better, how it's going to make for the CIO the internal associate experience better, that this isn't just about adding friction into uh, an already challenging environment. You know, like frontline healthcare workers, the SecOp pros are heroes day to day. You don't necessarily hear a lot about the work they're doing, but, uh, but Dave, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing some of the best practices. And thank you for the great work that you guys are, are doing out there and, and best of luck. Thanks for the exchange, it's been a pleasure. All right, and thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. Keep it right there.